Hi, I'm Ben. Welcome or welcome back to my channel where we find ourselves at the tail end of yet another year, which if I'm honest has come around a little bit too fast for my liking. But if you're anything like me, you will have set yourself a reading goal on your app of choice back at the very start of 2023. For me, that was Goodreads and I set myself the same goal I've done for the last few years, which is 52 books, one per week. It's a number that at a time kept increasing as reading became more of a core hobby of mine. But a few years ago, I decided to not let it escalate any further and put a bit of a pin in it at 52 because I didn't want to feel under too much pressure. I do like a goal to keep me motivated but I don't want it to make me feel bad. Basically I didn't want to log into Goodreads and have it tell me I'm a piece of crap because I'm a million books behind schedule. Luckily this year I have already hit my goal and I'll be telling you more about that in future videos but I know some people out there might be a little bit behind might be a lot behind and you may be wondering how best to use the remaining days of December. You could use them to pick up a book like A Little Life. This is a 700 page beast that will add a generous sprinkling of misery to your holiday season. If you are in the UK this could pair quite well with watching EastEnders because that's always a misery fest at this time of year. If you're not from the UK EastEnders is a soap opera and for some reason there's a strange tradition where someone always seems to die on Christmas Day. I have no idea why. A Little Life might be a good choice if you've got a page count related goal but I think most people set their goals around the number of books and it's definitely the only option on Goodreads. If you do set your goals differently from just page counts or number of books do let me know in the comments because I'm really intrigued by alternative ways to do it. Anyway to all of you out there who are a little bit behind today I have got your back with 10 short books to tell you about. I've got five books I've read, five books I haven't and all of them are under 200 pages. In fact I have crunched the numbers and their combined page counts add up to about two copies of A Little Life. So you could read this through twice, or you could read all 10 of these. Before I dive into each book, it is always worth remembering and reiterating that reading is not a competition, and there are no prizes for reading a bunch of stuff that you don't like or care about just to hit some arbitrary number. And I do need to remind myself of that sometimes, especially being in a community like Booktube where there are so many people reading so many different books and recommending so many great sounding things that it's just really easy to get carried away. And I do find that if I try to read too fast and cram all of these books in, it hampers my comprehension and it affects my enjoyment of reading. And that's kind of the main point, like we all read at different speeds and those speeds change over time, they might change over the year, but whether you read five books in a year or a hundred books, it should not be stressful, it should be fun or thought provoking or stimulating, whatever it is that you get out of reading. So this video and this set of books that I'm recommending is not an attempt to foster competitive reading, but to help you out if you're a goal motivated person who's a little bit behind. Or if you just like short books, maybe you'll find some good suggestions here. With that said, let's get into the books and I'll start with the ones that I have read. The first one I want to tell you about is for anyone out there who is not willing to let spooky season go, and that is Come Closer by Sarah Gran. This is a tale of possession about a woman who is going through a hostile takeover by a demon. It affects all aspects of her life, including her work, and in particular, her relationship to her husband. And I just found this like riotously funny. It does say on the back that it's deeply scary and terrifying and that it will scare the pants off you. I don't really remember being that scared, but I do remember just having a really good time with it. It's provocative, it's very darkly comic, and I just think it's a very surefire, fun time with a book that will only take you a short amount of time to read because it's only 165 pages long. It's just so fun and I think horror fans will absolutely love it. But even if you're not someone who reads a lot of horror, I think it's very well well written and you will get a lot out of the experience of reading this one. Top notch. Next I'm going to take us all the way back to World War One, and I'm not sure what it is about books set during the war that feel very wintry to me. It might just be that Armistice Day is in November and so I've built up that association. But regardless of the wintry vibes this is a book that everyone should read and that is At Night All Blood Is Black by David Diop translated from the original French by Anna Moscovakis. This was the winner of the International Booker Prize a few years back and it's a book set largely in the trenches of World War I, or the Great War as it was known. The central characters of this novel are Alpha and Mademba, two Senegalese friends and soldiers fighting in the war on behalf of France. The inciting incident of the novel is when Mademba is mortally wounded and begs his friend to end his suffering, but Alpha can't bring himself to do it. And after Mademba dies, 
he kind of loses his mind a little bit and really embraces the savagery of war. It makes him a really successful soldier, but he also starts to scare those around him. This is an absolutely fantastic book. And to be honest, I was very surprised when I realized that it made the cut for this video when I was scanning my shelves. It looms so much larger in my mind as a story than I would believe could fit into 145 pages. A really, really fantastic novel about friendship and masculinity and war and colonialism. I'd really highly recommend reading it. Right, we're moving now from World War One to World War Two because the next book I'm recommending is A Meal in Winter by Hubert Mingarelli, translated also from French by Sam Taylor. This is a book set in the Polish countryside where we're following a group of German soldiers. They are stationed there and they're living under some extreme and harsh environmental conditions. They are cold, they are hungry, and they are running out of food. And they go off into the countryside on a hunt. I don't want to give many more details than that. The blurb does spoil it, but I don't want to because I went into this book blind and my experience of it was all the more arresting because of that. This is quite a provocative book in terms of the perspective that it takes because it gets us to sympathise with these people who we think of as bad and evil. And I'm not saying it dispels any of that, it's not really what it's trying to do, but it does have a lot to say about the human condition and what people can be driven to do under specific circumstances and conditions. I think this is a very powerful little novella that clocks in at 138 pages. It packs a lot in there, not in terms of plot, but in terms of character and the interactions between people. And I just found it, yeah, really, really powerful. Oh, the next book is actually written by someone who blurbs the last one, and that is Cunan Jones and his book, Still Aside. We are out of the wars with this book, but sadly not onto particularly happy territory because this is a near future dystopia. And I think you'll agree that the cover has very chilly, wintry vibes. If you are unfamiliar with what a Still Aside is, it is defined right at the start of the book and it is a continual dripping of water or it's a law which gives you the right or duty relating to the collection of water from or onto an adjacent land. And water is very central to this book because it's set at a time in the future where drinking water is pretty scarce. Now this is unfortunately a very scary but also believable future. And there are parts of the world that are already suffering drinking water shortages. I think there was some news earlier in the year about Montevideo in Uruguay needing to ration the use of water because there was such a shortage. This book though is set mainly in London where we are following a number of stories really, but one of the core ones is around this water train that brings drinking water into the capital. And there's a lot of security around it because it's seen as precious cargo and a target for thieves and terrorists. It's not the most sustainable solution though, so in parallel, there is this big infrastructure plan that aims to basically tow an entire iceberg into the center of the city as a source of drinking water. It's written in a pretty chilly way. I think the prose keeps you at a bit of an arm's length. It's written pretty dispassionately, um, and it's all in like, they're not vignettes, but it's a vignette style where there's lots of white space on the page, paragraphs are often just one line long, but it makes for a really quick but engrossing read. This was also written originally, I think, as a radio drama for BBC Radio 4. So that would be a really cool way to listen to it. I did have a look on the Radio 4 website and unfortunately it doesn't seem to be available, but if you can get your hands on the audio, it might be a really nice way to enjoy this book given that it was written with that in mind from the very start. Underrated one this, I think it is both scary, but also great and gripping and I loved it. The last of the books that I've read is All My Friends Are Superheroes by Andrew Kaufman. Uh, this is a book that is very short actually, it's only 108 pages long, but it is quite absurd. It's a really strange and comic book about a man called Tom who has a lot of friends who are superheroes. This is a world where superheroes are a pretty banal part of life. In fact, they are so common that Tom is marrying a woman with superpowers. Unfortunately, at the wedding, Tom's new wife's ex is also a superhero and he's a bit disgruntled and he has the powers of like hypnotism or something and he, and he makes Tom's wife think that Tom is invisible, which obviously causes some problems in the marriage because she thinks he's just buggered off somewhere. The book basically takes place over the course of an aeroplane ride because Tom's wife has decided to move to Vancouver when she thinks she's been deserted by her new husband. But we jump back and forth as we see sort of what's been going on. I can't remember 
too many specific details of this book but I do remember the vibes and I remember it being like really funny there's something about it that reminds me a lot of the tv show the boys not in terms of like gore and violence but just in terms of the way that it clearly has reverence for superheroes and comic books and all that sort of stuff but it doesn't take it too seriously and it doesn't take itself too seriously it has a lot of fun with those tropes and it imagines what some of those things would actually translate to be like if they were in the real world a very fun little book that i think is worth the couple of hours it would take to read this story on then to the books that i haven't read so i'll probably go through these a little bit quicker and the first one of these is Eastbound by Maylis de Kerengal. And this was originally written in French again. I don't know why there are so many French books on this list, but it was translated by Jessica Moore. This has been on my radar mainly because it was featured in the New York Times Best Books of the Year. This is one of the top five fiction books that they have reviewed this year. It's a very short little novella and... Actually, funny enough, the last one was set over the course of a plane journey, and this book is set over the course of a train journey. I believe it's set on a train going through the Trans-Siberian Railway, and mainly centres around a Russian conscript who does not want to be conscripted, and so he's looking to escape. Uh, and he meets a French woman, and she also wants to get off the train somehow, and so I think they help each other. I've heard it is very beautifully written, but also very compulsive and full of tension. So I think this could be a real corker. And it's also published by an indie press in the UK, La Fugitive, which is great if you are doing in December and you want to read some indies this month. Another book on my radar because of the New York Times Best Books of the Year list, but not the 2023 list, the 2022 list, is Stay True by Hua Xu. This was one of their top five non-fiction books of last year, but it also won the 2023 Pulitzer for memoir and autobiography. This is a coming-of-age memoir that Xu has written, largely centred around his friendship with a young man called Ken, who sadly died in a car accident when he was very young. I've heard this is really beautifully written and it's a bit of an elegy for his friend, but also one of the blurbs refers to it as a mixtape. And I have read the first couple of pages of this and there's a bit right at the start about not measuring distance in terms of kilometers or miles, but in terms of the number of songs that play along the drive. And I love the idea of that and I hope that music and pop culture and stuff is, is a central part of this memoir because that would be really great. The next book is Another Brooklyn by Jacqueline Woodson. And this is one that I don't know tons about. It's set in 1970s Brooklyn. It's apparently very haunting and poetic and beautiful. And it centers around this group of friends. I quite like the style that it's written in. Kind of similar to Still Aside, actually. Like there's these very short paragraphs. But yeah, a book about friendship in New York in the 70s sounds like a winner to me. And it was also a National Book Award finalist. And there are often really good picks in the National Book Awards. So I think this could be a real winner. I feel like out of the books so far, this might be the one that most people watching have read. So if you do have any thoughts on this, I'd love to hear them. And if you think I should prioritize this sooner rather than later, do let me know. Right, our penultimate book is Fear and Trembling by Amelie Notham, which, no. It's also translated from French by Adriana Hunter. I don't know why this list is so French heavy. Is it that French speakers like to write short books? Or are French words so long that when you translate them, they are suddenly very tiny little books. That doesn't make any sense though, because Les Mis is absolutely massive, isn't it? Anyway, Notham is a Belgian author, and there are rumblings that her most recent book could be in contention for the International Booker next year. This is one she released a while ago. I don't know if this is autofiction or anything, but the main character is called Amelie, and this is her experience of going out to Japan to work for a Japanese company. The blurb says that it's a comic nightmare of terror and self-abasement, disturbing, hilarious, and totally convincing. So I'm expecting like a lot that will take the mickey out of lots of, I guess, corporate customs that Japan might have. It's probably very darkly comic. It's given me similar vibes to The Factory by Hiroko Oyamada, which I read recently. And I think there could be a little sprinkling of Kafka-esque nightmares in here. I think it seems fun. It's only 132 pages. Could well be worth a couple of hours reading. Right, we are on to the final book, and I think this sounds like a real cracker. So if you are in the mood for some historical fiction, or maybe in the mood for a thriller, why not have both with 
Rizzio by Denise Mina. Now, I have to admit, I only have this book because I was heavily influenced by Louise Savage, who described this book on one of her videos. Maybe it was like a wrap up or something. And it sounded really fantastic. So when I saw it in my local like discount bookshop for four pounds in hardback, I just had to snap it up. This is a historical thriller centered around Mary Queen of Scots and one particular event in history, which I assume is a real event, where she has sat down to dinner with her husband, but also her friend and confidant, the Italian David Rizzio. But what Mary doesn't know is that her husband has orchestrated the murder of Rizzio and has the palace surrounded by his would-be assassins. It sounds very gripping and it's only 118 pages long and thrillers tend to read pretty quickly anyway. So I imagine I or you would absolutely fly through this. Seems like it could be a winner for all you morbid fans of murder out there. So those are my 10 picks to help you reach your Goodreads goals this year. There are so many great short books out there though, so if you have read any recently or read any a long time ago that you'd really highly recommend to other readers in order to get a few short books in before the end of the year, please do let me know in the comments. Or if you've read any of these ones, I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. If you liked this video, please do give it a like. It really helps my channel out. And if you are not subscribed, but you'd like to see more of my content, then hit subscribe and you'll get a new video from me about once a week. But until next time, toodles.